first uh, activity is uh, recap the day one uh, program. Actually, we can start it from that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gauri. And uh, thank you for all the participants who, have, who are back along with our team of experts and uh, the project staff and of course NSF. Uh, you see, uh, as this uh, workshop is on guidelines for the safe use of GMOs slash LMOs in the laboratory, we had our first session yesterday on background and the key concepts. Uh, so there was an overview of the regulatory framework provided along with the process of preparation by uh, Dr. Gauri, which NSF has followed. And uh, subsequent to that, you know, uh, Dr. Chamari, of course, gave the requirement for why do we need these guidelines uh, for the use of GMOs and LMOs? And then I had introduced to the concept of risk assessment and the containment requirements prior to even understanding, you know, what, how, why are we after all having this biosafety uh, procedures and levels in that. So uh, taking forward from there that the risk assessment is the first and the preliminary part because I will have the biosafety requirements commensurate uh, to the uh, to the requirement of uh, you know to the hazards or the risk associated with that. And we also understood yesterday that risk is a function of hazard into exposure, which I explained in a big way that you know once we have the containment procedures even the vsl even the you know risk group 4 is we are able to contain uh, so with this background uh, we will now move on to and we also uh, yesterday understood that uh, the containment uh, can be of two types one is the physical containment which will be through facilities and which will be through uh, procedures and you know many other things which will be explained to you today by our esteemed experts uh, how to operationalize that. Uh, but they can also be a biological containment where we when we are doing the genetic modification, we are sort of, you know, uh, creating such strains that they lose their infectivity or other, uh, you know, uh, parameters which which contribute to their being hazard. We also understood that nothing is intrinsically hazard, no living organism is intrinsically had uh, all, I mean, biological organisms are not intrinsically and so are GMOs. So everything has to be done all by case by case basis. So building on what we did yesterday, uh, today we will start with, you know, uh, how to identify the biosafety containment level and what exactly are the containment levels for various types of organisms. Uh, so I will just uh, share my slides in that uh, um, context uh, so you see what exactly is a biosafety containment level Biosafety containment levels, they describe the laboratory practices, safety equipments and the facilities appropriate for various groups of organisms based on the risks, which we understood yesterday. Uh, and these laboratory practices, etc., as I mentioned, will be explained by our esteemed experts. So biosafety levels are referred commonly as BSL, you know, BSL1, BSL2, like that you would have uh, understood and they are based on existing international approaches to pathogenic organisms. You know, the whole thing started with the pathogenic organisms. Uh, there are uh, sometimes three, sometimes four, but as far as uh, uh, most organisms are concerned, they are generally four types of BSLs, and they are arranged in order of increasing stringency to reflect the level of risk involved. This is very important, you know, when Dr. Lalita Gauda will explain or Sir will explain, and also what is written in the guidelines, it is like there is X requirement for BSL-1. Then when BSL-2 comes, then BSL-1 plus additional requirements. Then BSL-2 plus additional requirements. So that's what you know, what is the increasing stringency required 
that is always mentioned in the guideline. You see, uh, I just now mentioned that I'm just going to repeat through this flow diagram that what is the workflow? How do you uh, come to the uh, identification of the suitable level? As I mentioned, we start with the risk assessment, hazard identification, estimation of that hazard likelihood, estimation of hazard consequences, and then likelihood into consequences will help me determine what is the GMO, which class of GMOs does it belong to. Once I have identified the class of my GMO, based on that, the containment measures will come, which is biosafety level 1 to 4. So the G first you have to classify your organism and then the containment measures which which need to be adopted. Adoption of the suitable containment level. As I said, there are very well defined international methodologies available and mostly the kind of uh, information which is given here. I, we have just tried to list some of the resources which include, for example, microorganisms, laboratory biosafety manual by WHO, micro animals, there are guidelines by CDC, and then also guidelines by NIH also mentioned about uh, micro uh, animals. Then plants, there is a research involving recombinant molecules, NIH also gives, and there is another uh, uh, very useful resource, uh, which is called a practical guide to containment in plant biosafety research. These are the ones which are generally followed by countries. For orthopods, there are orthopod containment line, uh, guidelines, which is the nine, 2019 version. Most of these will be regularly updated. The reason being that new microorganisms might have been discovered or new properties of, you know, uh, the existing market microorganisms or mutations or whatever, various things can happen. So there is a continuous updation done by agencies who first, you know, who work on this. So uh, I will, as an example, I will just pick up the WHO classification of microorganisms. This is generally the most uh, cited reference and uh, most clarity is there on that. So, so how do they classify the microorganisms? We have to understand this and then we will know how the GMOs are classified. Based on their relative hazards when used for laboratory work, classification of infective microorganisms is based on pathogenicity for humans and availability of the preventive measures and treatment. So the, both are important, you know. One is of course the broader pathogenicity. You know, this organism, does it cause diseases to humans? And then while doing the laboratory, any relative hazards also are taken into account. So if we look at this classification, the risk group one is no, or I, I, I shared this table yesterday also in the form of a table. It is almost the same, but it is very important. And so we will just have a quick look at it. So risk group one is no or low individual and community risk, a microorganism that is unlikely to cause any human or animal disease. Moderate individual risk, low community risk. So risk group two is that somebody who is working or may cause may get some infection, but then unlikely to cause a serious hazard to the community, livestock or environment. And then uh, group three is high individual risk, uh, low community risk, a pathogen that usually causes a serious human or animal disease, but does not ordinarily spread from one infected individual to another. It cannot spread. And effective treatment and preventive measures are available. And group four is high individual and community risk. So this is what is how the the you know uh, classification is done. But this is the WHO classification. Every country or region will classify these uh, microorganisms for their territory. So and that will be based on again the parameters are almost same, but you have to look at the conditions in your country. So pathogenicity of the organism, mode of transmission and host range of the organism. This, these may be influenced by existing levels of immunity in the local population, density, movement of the host population, presence of vectors and standards of environmental hygiene. Local availability of the effective preventive measures. There might be some treatment, but it doesn't, you know, exist in my country. Profile access by immunization, administration of anti-sera, 
sanitary measures and other parameters local availability of effective treatment you know that is also very important this may be again passive immunization like through you know uh, and post exposure vaccination use of antimicrobials antivirals and takes into account the possibility of emergence of drug resistance so why why we are listing these are the factors they you don't have to worry about them but then you you should know about it that this is how the classification is done in each country the microorganisms can be assigned at a higher or a lower degree depending on the prevalence of that disease in the country so there is group classification of organisms for sri lanka has also been done and we have kept that we have not done it it was already done and so that has been included as an annex 1 to the guidelines and that is something which should be followed so now coming to this we said this was the microorganisms but what we are going to talk today is about the genetically modified organisms or the living modified organisms so how do we how do we uh, you know uh, go forward and identify so this is of course first of all the organism which is i am going to study and which i am going to genetically manipulate so i should know the level of containment for that particular organism so once i know the host organism then i will also see uh, in addition to the host organism i will also see effect of gene products such as the toxicity physiological activity allergenicity etc which means i have inserted a gene into it and my final gm gmo does it contain any of the gene products which i have inserted maybe additional toxicity any physiological activity and allergenicity so this is what is going to be the factor to determine the level of containment for gmo any gmo known to be more hazardous than the parent strain suppose i find on the basis of two that oh yeah this was e coli but now i have added this gene and this might be more hazardous so then i should take it to higher containment level reduction of the containment is also possible for example if it's a pathogenic strain but i have done the genetic modification and you know it's it is behaving like an attenuated strain or it has lost its virulence then this can also be Uh, reduced scale can also be there but final assessment will have to consider the risk group of the source of the sequence and the assessment of the functions that may be encoded by these sequences and also most importantly if we are making more than one genetic change then we also have to study the synergistic effect of the genetic change as one of the key attributes while deciding the appropriate containment levels so we have the levels for organisms and then when we are doing it for gmos or lmos this is the process that we have to follow now biosafety levels whenever they are defined you know they are the minimum level of containment and they serve as a guide for carrying out the contained use activity you can i mean if you feel you can have a additional uh, you know precautions or anything nobody stops you from doing that but this is the minimum which has to be maintained so although you do not have as yet the functional uh, ibscs but uh, as these guidelines get adopted and uh, we are going to have institute mechanism for ibsc is in place and this is the procedure in all other countries because there is an institutional by safety committee so if researchers are unsure about the containment they should consult their committee and the committee will decide that this category should be under this so in that way the researcher not only gets uh, you know not only gets uh, uh, guidance on uh, which what i should do uh, but also they are sort of you know because it's a regulated products so you also have a what you say the collective wisdom and the collective decision in the knowledge of the heads of the organization that we decided because it falls in this containment level because of this 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 reason and all that should be very nicely documented like we have in our laboratories general manuals you know lab manuals are there in all labs so we should also have institutional biosafety manuals and sops so that everybody everybody who is working with it in the labs knows about it and also there is an institutional oversight by the institutional biosafety committees 
I mean, what I'm explaining you is the correct way of working with GMOs and LMOs, which probably at this point we are not following that much. So if I come to the uh, uh, biosafety levels for, so, so what we have done in the guidelines based on the various categories of organisms, the biosafety levels for various, uh, uh, you know, uh, categories have been defined, which I will take you through, walk you through the guidelines. And this is the section seven of the guidelines, and this provides the, uh, the uh, you know, what all is covered in which biosafety level. So here it is uh, very simple based on like we just now discussed the potential pathogenicity. There are four levels. G the level of the microorganism is generally the GMM level. So RG1, RG2, RG3, RG4. If you have inserted any gene, then you should, uh, you know, take, uh, take it uh, to the additional level. So if you see this diagram on side, we have just tried to give examples, things like Baker's yeast, falls in BSL-1, measles virus in BSL-2, tuberculosis-3, Ebola-4, like that, you know. So there is a degree of uh, risk and degree of uh, containment increases. Now, uh, when we are working, when we are defining this, the experiments with genetically modified microorganisms involving risk group 1 that have no known potential to give rise to infectious agents uh, these will be our GMM1. And the second would be GMM2, where we have approved host vector. Okay, in one we will also include the approved host vector system, provided the donor DNA has no known risk to human, plants, animals, or environment. Because sometimes you use different vector system, host vector systems. So this is the criteria that we have to follow. I'm not going to read through all because this is straight from the guidelines and all of you have the copy of the guidelines. In case anyone has any doubt, they can always get back to us, you know. Then two will be again risk group two or anything which is, you know, the second point is important here. If my baseline organism is GM, GMM, uh, sorry, RG1, but I have the DNA from RG2, then I will, it will become BSL-2. So this is important to understand in case of uh, the GMMs, that is the genetically modified microorganisms. Similarly, the same procedure follows here. Three means risk group three or any other GMM having DNA from RG3 uh, with some degree of you know virulence and all that risk assessment, you would have already done that. And similarly, the four. But, but another thing to remember is that the, in the guidelines, it's very clear that this is biosafety level for microorganisms. So it doesn't mean it is a requirement for a, I mean, a plant can also be grown in that or an animal can also be grown in that. So that one has to keep in mind that everything is different from different category of organisms. So it's not a general BSL one that, you know, or BSL four where I can, you know, uh, grow any of these things. The requirements for all types of organisms are very different. The next level is the biosafety uh, level for genetically modified plants. Now here, the purpose of the plant containment is to avoid the unintentional transmission of GM plants. So now here, the infectivity criteria is not there. The plant is not pathogenic to, you know, humans like that. But what is important is the criteria is the it should not escape into the environment. And also, we also have to say when, when we say plant, then the plant associated microorganisms and plant associated small animals, also the containment requirements will apply to that also. For example, I'm, I'm working on a legume and there is rhizobium below, then that rhizobium will also be subjected to the same level of containment requirements will follow. Is similarly, the small animals which they work with, they will also be like, for example, no, uh, we have a very interesting uh, research underway here where there is a group of researchers who have developed genetically modified rhizobium and there's another which has developed genetically modified azotobacter. Both these organisms are used as biofertilizers. So when I have to do a trial of, let's say, azotobacter in a field of wheat, then the, the azotobacter also has to follow the biosafety level for plants. 
So this is what it means. This is divided into four biosafety levels, BBSL 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, and this will also apply to activities in the greenhouses and screenhouses. So again, in the same manner, the biosafety level definition is experiments on modify, plants modified with genes from other plants that have no known invasive trait. So here, since we are talking of the environment and all those issues, so here our risk group classification is based on invasiveness or creating weeds in the, in the you know, uh, environment and so on. Similarly, the, that's the first part. After the comma, if you see, if you have plants modified with genes from microorganisms that fall under RG1, they'll fall here. So there are three for, uh, for the purpose of making slides. I have clubbed them, but I encourage everyone who is going to work with that, sorry, uh, to look at the section seven of the uh, section seven of the guidelines, and that very nicely explains what all is covered and what all is not covered. Now, as I said, weediness. If you if we move on further and you go to the GMP BSL four, where you will see that experiments which involve certain exotic readily transmiss transmissible infectious organisms or plant pathogens of nature Sri Lankan crops and these experiments have to be performed in the presence of vector then the biosafety level 4 is very very important because you want to protect your biodiversity you want to protect your uh, requirement you know normally this kind of level will hardly anyone will come but it is still important to include in the you know in the guidelines so that if and when any such a situation comes, then the stringent measures have to be followed. So the next uh, uh, biosafety level is the for the category of organisms is the animals. So we we have now gen, uh, microorganisms, plants we dealt with. Now we have animals. Now in the animals, like we we read about microorganisms and we said infectivity. So here again the animals is to prevent zoonotic infections transmitted by animals, cross infection between experimental animals and unintentional release of uh, GMOs from these animals into the environment. All these are the reasons why we want to have containment during the experimentation. Once it is approved, once it has been studied, it is found to be safe, then it will be cultivated in open. Now animals in this particular case may be either small laboratory animals or large domestic animals. You know, people who are into the field of biotechnology, they know that extensive research is underway on all types of organisms, you know, including plants, animals, small animals, big animals, fish and everything, insects. So activities with GM animals, what would they include? Generally, you will be working at the in the laboratory actually, introduction of foreign DNA into either the fertilized oocyte or zygote or early embryo, which may be performed in inside the animal or may involve the whole animal. So sometimes we do the lab work and then we put it in the whole animal. So every activity is to be covered. The guidelines have been prepared in such a way so that most of the activities are covered and the containment levels are defined. Introduction of a fragment of the genome to produce GM animal secre secreting infectious agents and use of GM microorganisms to infect animals for various studies. So here again we have four levels. The BSL1 is when the breeding of animals transformed with sequences of viral vectors belonging to RG1, housing of no no knockout rodents, because knockout rodents generally will be very safe. So they have been included in the biosafety level one. Then two, three, four, it just goes on to, you know, explain each and every this thing. Uh, the next category which comes is the biosafety levels for genetically modified orthopods or insects. Why we have written like that? Because GMA is animals. So we wanted another abbreviation for that. So we have used GMI. So here the purpose of establishment is to again, prevent and establish the experimental orthopods into the natural environment and ensure the safety of the lab personnel. 
you see yesterday dr tyagi mentioned during the discussions that you know mosquitoes is a totally different ball game than our uh, plants or anything or uh, microorganisms or different type of facilities and a different type of biosafety levels will be required and another important thing is that in as i said these are very general and you have to do risk assessment on case by case but in case of arthropods and insects we yesterday also discussed that they are very very uh, they have variable you know characteristics and they have complex life cycles so the procedures and practices will have to be species specific and the third most important point is that all life cycle stages eggs larvae nymph adult they all have to be handled within the containment facility and because of the small size highly motile characteristics of some arthropods relatively long life and resistance of some stages to harsh environments these are the typical characteristics of some arthropods and they have to be taken care when we are designing the facility again these facilities have been divided into gmi bsl1 gmi bsl2 gmi bsl3 and and each category what all is covered for what that has been very uh, you know uh, uh, this thing uh, very uh, defined in detail uh, in the insects i would also like to point out that generally dna from this group 4 you know that would generally not be permitted in any country so we have also written that for such things you have to seek the permission first even before initiating for that matter you have to inform for everything but these kind of highly pathogenic kind of things are generally not permitted uh, the last uh, thing which we have covered uh, this was at the request of particularly the uh, from sri lanka uh, the esteemed experts uh, i remember dr pereira wanting that you know fish should also be covered because we want to be able to uh, you know make these guidelines again and again so here if you see the purpose is again to prevent the escape of aquatic animal pathogens into the natural aquatic environment and to protect humans from the pathogens also so the requirements are divided here into three levels which is bsl1 bsl2 and bsl3 and why we have done this is based on the international guidelines and the accepted methodology you see in many of these things Uh, there is no use in reinventing the wheels because the the uh, reputed organizations in developed countries and especially the organizations like you know which have high credibility like who of course is a multilateral one similarly nih cdc they are also very important so it is always good to follow what every country is following and because they are based on discussions among scientists and consensus documents are there and as i indicated these are the minimum requirements in addition to this if the regulator wants to specify the principal investigator wants to do they are free to you know uh, uh, put more but the minimum requirements will generally be through this channel so here again 1 2 3 all have been uh, indicated but it is generally advised that for 3 we are not going to give any uh, specific list of activities because here again there should be a risk assessment done and then uh, the ibsc should be approached and they should uh, uh, procedures uh, you know uh, it should be properly you know uh, identified and taken permission and then started now here uh, the last point is very important that the the when you submit your proposal for research involving aquatic organism you have to also describe the contained requirements or methods used but also the procedures for treatment of the waste water from the facility so these are like some of the additional con con complications which have to be followed in all these organisms so i will close here and this is like a baseline information on what are the biosafety containment level for research with various types of gmos and the guidelines are in place the guidelines have been reviewed by all of you and we have incorporated the comments and now uh, i will uh, give the floor to uh, if there are any questions or i can give the floor to dr lalita gorda who will explain you about the laboratory facilities 
work practices and containment equipments what are the special considerations for gmos thank you very much We can take uh, questions at the end of the session, and uh, now Dr. Lalita can uh, start her presentation. Yeah. Viba, um, you need to quit. share screen, Dr. Viba. Dr. Dr. Gora is calling you. Dr. Viva, you need to quit uh, share screen. Ah, yes. Dr. Ahuja, uh, can you uh, stop screen share? Yeah, can you quit uh, from your screen sharing? Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So, uh, what I'm going to do is continue with what Dr. Viva said, uh, talking about the laboratory uh, facilities and work uh, practices and contain uh, equipment. So, uh, in the laboratory, the reason we need to follow all these practices is because there are a large number of laboratory acquired infections, especially to the human. They include viral, bacterial, as well as from exposure to chemicals and uh, other aerosols. And sometimes you have infections due to the uh, sharps, splashes, etc. So these are laboratory acquired infections and we need to protect ourselves when we are working in the lab and we need to protect the environment also. So uh, we have what is known as, as good laboratory practices. I can't list the whole list of good laboratory practices, but common practices that can be practiced are hygienic practices which are like no smoking, eating, applying cosmetics, etc. in the lab, washing your the hands procedure when you enter the lab and leave the lab, and decontaminating the bench before and after your work. Also very important is proper attire, that is the lab coat, full sleeve lab coat with back buttons, safety glasses or goggles, uh, gloves, and uh, for many of our countries, especially in South Asia, putting this closed shoes is very, very important. And next is to know the work you are doing. And uh, as Viba had very clearly said, you should know which organism you're working with. You should know which chemicals you're working with. Uh, what is the safety? Read the uh, material safety data sheets of each and uh, every uh, chemical and also learn about the pathogenicity and the safety of the organism that you're working uh, with. So uh, WHO describes laboratory biosafety is three things that using containment uh, principles, technologies and practices, and these are mainly to prevent unintentional exposure of personal to pathogens and toxins or their accident release into the environment. So the principles of biosafety, there are standard practices, just like the good laboratory practices, which are applied across all the uh, safety, that is uh, across plants, animals, microorganisms, arthropods, etc. And then there are special practices and considerations for each group. It also includes the safety equipment, such as the biosafety cabinets that you use, what are the level cabinets that you need to use, whether you need to use a B1 or an A1 with 100% exhaust, 
or 70% exhaust, 30% recirculation. This is very important. Also the autoclaves, whether they are single door, double door, depending on the pathogenicity. The facility design and construction, especially very, very important when you're working with plants, especially the GMOs, as we will see, and the increasing levels of protection as you go from one to four. And as explained to you, two involves all that you follow in one plus something extra. Three involves what you follow in one and two plus something extra. And four, of course, is the highest level of biosafety in all the categories that have been uh, explained earlier. So uh, one of the most important thing is to understand the risk. And we know from risk, risk assessment, we need to identify the uh, hazard and find out uh, what are the risks from the uh, organism that we are uh, working with. These include the uh, infectivity, what prevention is available, how it enters the route of entry, the uh, stability, etc. And based on this, WHO has uh, classified the microorganisms into four, and uh, there is no international classification. It depends on each of your countries. So the risk group one, for example, are E. coli, Bacillus, Subtilis, and uh, organisms like this, what we generally use uh, in the research laboratories for expression, uh, etc. Risk group two are those which can cause human and animal disease, but they are unlikely to be a serious hazard because there is available effective treatment available. These include like Vibrio cholera or the Aspergillus, which uh, produces aflatoxin, the parasites like the um, mosquito uh, pa parasite, the plasmodium, and those like the uh, viral and rickettsial uh, organisms. So these all come under risk group two. These are examples because there is a treatment avail available. Risk group three is a little higher. It causes serious human disease or animal disease, and uh, they do not, uh, but does not ordinarily spread from one infection to and effective treatment and preventive measures are available. Among these, you will see one of these organisms that is Francisella tularinens is one of the most commonly acquired laboratory infections and across the uh, globe. Of course, Clostridium botulinum, we look at it in canned foods, which uh, is a nerve toxin. And you also have the foot and mouth. And risk four is the very high individual and community risk for currently which no treatment is known, such as the Ebola virus or the Nipah virus or the uh, encephalitis virus. So although it was explained to you, I thought, you know, you should have know a few examples of these. So the principles of con containment are there are two levels of containment. One is the primary containment, that is protecting your per, uh, self by using the personal protection uh, equipment and uh, the immediate laboratory uh, environment, such as using uh, the biosafety uh, cabinets and of course using good laboratory practices. This good laboratory practices that we explain for the laboratories is not the capital GLP, but we put it in the lower case uh, GLP, which is in the uh, lab. The capital GLP is what OCD says for animal experiments. And the secondary containment is protection uh, of the environment external immediately to the laboratory. So I'll just briefly uh, tell you uh, the primary containment, as I said, are due to uh, good laboratory practice. And in microbiology labs or molecular biology labs, containment equipment such as biosafety cabinets, laminar hoods, PCR hoods, etc. The secondary containment is the special laboratory design. Examples like using negative pressure so that nothing from the laboratory goes out and everything uh, gets in. 
structural uh, design so, uh, so that you enter through an air shower. I'll give you examples uh, with figures uh, later. Air showers uh, so that you're decontaminated before you enter. And again, you have an air shower when you leave so that you are uh, decontaminated. And the structural uh, design aspects are using a double door or a door which uh, opens inside or using uh, crossover uh, benches. So uh, the biosafety levels and practices uh, in the uh, laboratory for any research, whether it is recombinant uh, DNA research or any other uh, research, as you see for biosafety level one, the safety equipment, there is none and you can do open bench work. But however, we do recommend doing all the work in a biosafety cabinet. In the biosafety level two, you use the good microbiology techniques or lab practices, protective clothing, put a biohazard uh, signage, and you must use biological safety cabinets to prevent potential aerosols coming into the uh, laboratory. In biosafety uh, level three, you have special clothing, as you will see in uh, a figure, uh, the controlled access to the room or to the laboratory by using a card access or by thumb uh, by fingerprinting. And there is a directional airflow. That means the laboratories are kept in such a way that they have negative uh, air pressure, that pressure, uh, atmosphere uh, pressure, which is below the atmospheric uh, pressure. And the safety equipment are the biological safety cabinets and other primary uh, devices. The uh, biosafety level four is the um, highest level, which includes all these three. Plus, it should have an airlock entry. There should be security, uh, very important. There is a shower so that you shower uh, after working in the laboratory and there are special waste disposal mechanisms including the treatment of the water that uh, uh, leaves the uh, lab and you have to wear uh, positive pressure suits i'm sure all of you have seen you know the way uh, currently for the coronavirus what uh, everybody is uh, wearing so this is mainly uh, when you're working uh, you know, with microorganisms and thing to protect not only you, but also the uh, environment. So here you see for the biosafety level two, where you need to use the signages, uh, which is important. So these are international signages, which must be posted on the uh, uh, door or on the biosafety cabinet of the uh, laboratory. It should also contain information on the biosafety officer who is in charge of the laboratory or a person who should be informed on in case of uh, any um, mishap, contact information of the hospital, the doctor, and also the organism which one is working with must be pasted either on the door of the laboratory very clearly uh, with the signature of the biosafety officer, or this must be there on the uh, biosafety cabinet. So this is uh, very important. And when you came, come to biosafety level three, in addition to all that, you need to wear these full body suits, which protect you completely. The um, sinks, etc. in the laboratory other than your hand washing or thing should not be touched with the hand. We should have either the sensor operated sinks or you should have the leg operated uh, pedals which uh, will operate the sink. And uh, many a time in the biosafety level three cabinets, you also have the uh, gloved hoods where you don't even have an opening in the uh, front. 
Biosafety level four is the highest uh, level of uh, containment as we have seen, and the level of containment is the biosafety level lab should be uh, completely isolated at a distance from any other uh, laboratory, and uh, they will have, in addition to all the primary barrier barriers, such as full body, air supply, positive pressure, uh, personal suit, uh, isolated zoom, a zone, a separate building, pressurized containment uh, uh, suits, chemical decontamination uh, showers at the entrance, different from that at the exit, the liquid effluent collection and decontamination uh, should be independent of the other laboratories. The air supply should be dedicated. Both the incoming and the exhaust has to be dedicated for that uh, purpose. And it is recommended that the BSL-4 uh, has no windows or even if there are windows, they have to be sealed and resistant to uh, breakage. So uh, these are the requirements when you're working with mic microbiology or uh, microbes or uh, pathogens uh, in there. As uh, uh, explained by uh, Viba, in the plant biosafety levels also, we have four levels. And here the containment levels are generally for the greenhouse. We call these the biosafety levels. The initial levels when you are uh, doing, making the plasmid uh, transformation, they are carried out in the laboratory. So in uh, the biosafety level one, this is generally if you're working with uh, harmless microorganisms such as agrobacterium or uh, tumefacients. In the uh, biosafety level, here the uh, experiments uh, conducted, where experiments are conducted for the possibility of survival and dissemination of the plant-related material. For example, the root knot uh, nematode or the uh, uh, any um, mosaic virus, the pectunia uh, gossipella, that is the ballworm, or pseudomonas, these are examples. If you are working with these or trying to make genetically modified organisms or plants with these type of uh, organisms, you need to use the containment level uh, two. The containment level three is used, especially if you are working with, say, toxins such as the vertebrate uh, toxins, such as maybe abrin uh, or uh, the uh, ricin from castor plant because they are very uh, toxic or microbial pathogens of plant. Examples where a biosafety uh, level three is uh, like testing the citrus plants engineered for the Asiatic bacterial canker or if you are inoculating transgenic peanut uh, plants containing the fungal resistant genes. The level four is of the highest containment. That is where you're working with exotic uh, plants or pathogens, especially viruses or pathogens uh, for uh, plants. And an example of uh, using a BLP4 would be for the maize streak. Uh, if you're trying to um, uh, genetically engineer the maize streak virus coat protein into the uh, maize uh, plants. So just let us look at some of the uh, containment uh, requirements. One of the first requirements is glazing. And what glazing means is whatever you use to cover your uh, greenhouse or containment facility should be absolutely uh, proof. Uh, I mean, they should be stuck. There should be no uh, air, air gaps and it should maintain that glazing throughout the entire experiment. So different types of glazing material are available. The second containment that uh, uh, is described for greenhouses is caulking and sealing. What caulking and sealing means is to seal all the outlets uh, for the effluents or the incoming uh, outlets 
thoroughly sealed so that there is no es uh, escape of uh, anything from the lab or in rodents, insects, etc. can enter. So this caulking and sealing actually restricts the passage of the insects. A third uh, containment that is used in addition to uh, the glazing is the screening. So here screening means using the proper screen uh, uh, for your containment uh, facility so that they exclude pests, they exclude pollinators from the greenhouses or conversely keep the experimental organism inside. So here on the right, you, I have given a table which has been taken from uh, the book where what type of mesh and what micron size must be used for different insects. For example, the melon aphids, you need to use a 340 uh, micron and for flower thrips, we need to use 190 micron. These are well defined. So initially, as uh, explained, you need to know exactly what you're working with, what are the insects that come in, in the environment, what are the uh, insects, uh, what are the predators, etc., that can uh, accidentally enter the containment facility and in Corolla can also not leave the cont uh, containment facility. And then you have to have uh, especially if the plants are pollinators, you need to have pollen filtration equip equipment which will trap the spores and the pollen and nettings are available, but it is recommended that you use the uh, HEPA filters, that is the high efficiency particulate uh, air filters, or you use the ULPA filters, that is the ultra um, efficient particulate air uh, filters and you have uh, HEPA filters of different size. A laboratory containment or a, a greenhouse containment commonly used is the air pressure. So you can uh, regulate the air pressure within the containment facility by keeping it at a negative air pressure. That means keeping it at an air pressure below atmospheric pressure and we know according to physics, anything goes from high pressure to low pressure. So here, um, the other way around, negative. So in a containment facility, if you have a negative uh, pressure, you will see that soon as the door is open, the air will rush in and the internal air cannot come out. And so this prevents any of the uh, plants, pollen, etc., which is in the greenhouse, uh, it will not allow it to come out. So most microbiology laboratories and greenhouse facilities have got uh, negative air pressure, which can be controlled by air handling uh, units. And then uh, in the level four uh, containment facilities, you generally have vestibules or extra rooms, uh, a room before you enter the containment facility, just like in the BSL-4, uh, uh, which actually has double doors. There is an uh, air uh, shower. There is a card reader and security so that only uh, uh, people who are permitted are uh, allowed to uh, go in. And these vestibules are gen commonly located at greenhouse uh, facilities. So here, uh, uh, just a few tables to tell you uh, what is required for the uh, uh, different uh, levels of plant containment. So if you look at the greenhouse uh, access, the limited or restricted access uh, has to be there for all the four. Uh, for access by having a security over there is for the level four, and you need to have documentation of who is entering when they are entering and when they are uh, leaving. The hazard signatures uh, prior uh, to uh, uh, entering uh, is required in four. And uh, this change of clothing and shower room 
uh, at the entrance is there in the uh, facility four. And of course, all individuals who are using the uh, containment levels must be trained prior to access and they must be trained continuously. So the greenhouse design, one of the most important designs in the greenhouse is that the flooring must have gravel or it must be cement, uh, cemented. And what this does is it prevents the germination of any accidental uh, seed uh, which has fallen onto the ground. So all greenhouse uh, flows must be uh, either gravel or they must be uh, concrete. The windows uh, of the uh, thing uh, you see in case of three and four, they have to be closed and uh, completely sealed. Glazing is required for three and four. And of course, uh, screens are recommended for uh, one and two. And the level three and four, just like a biosafety level four uh, for microorganism research has to be uh, separate. Um, the fencing and security, internal walls, bench top, et cetera. So here uh, uh, is, I picked this up from a paper which was uh, very interesting to uh, actually show you what is there. So here is a representative schematic of a containment uh, facility, which is involving a plant virus infectious clothes. That means the biosafety level four. So the first thing to notice over here is the geographic isolation because it is the level four. There is an isolation uh, of this from potential host plants, taking into account the pollen uh, dispersal mechanism and traveling distances of the insect vectors. Uh, two, you see the whole uh, area is has uh, concrete or gravel and this uh, enables identification of germinating plants or seeds and does not, uh, you know, you can remove them uh, when if you find them. Uh, three, the vestibule that I explained to you. So you have an airlock uh, entrance with provision of an air shower, a wash basin and a wet shower so that you decontaminate before you uh, enter. And number four that you see here is using the negative uh, air pressure uh, in combination with the HEPA filters for all the uh, rooms uh, uh, in the uh, greenhouse that you are uh, in the containment facility that you are uh, using. Uh, number five uh, is here is the autoclave, the equipment that is being used. Uh, it is recommended that you have a through the wall autoclave uh, in it and it should be double uh, walled. Number six, all the sinks, wash basins, shower and plant uh, runoff uh, material collected and filtered and must be uh, treated. There should be a separate uh, treatment plant for all the uh, runoff uh, thing. And number seven is where you work data collection point, microscope, camera and network computer, computer must be decontaminated continuously. And uh, number eight, what you have here is the provision for personal protective wear, that is laboratory coats, gloves, hair nets, uh, covered uh, shoes, etc. Number nine is to have sticky mats, yellow sticky mats or traps on the floor. In case some seed or thing uh, falls, it could be uh, removed. You can have uh, freezing treating compost, high temperature entrance and light controlled uh, vestibules because you might want to keep it dark to prevent uh, insects from uh, entering. And then you need to follow management practices, which are uh, a large number of practices and uh, they need all the personnel using the greenhouse or the containment facilities must be trained and must uh, follow the rules of access, the rules of apparel and uh, hygiene, uh, having the signages, uh, storage and handling of the material, 
how to transfer material from one room to another or from one greenhouse to another, uh, sterilization, disinfection, disposal, disposal, uh, pest control, uh, regularly uh, having the uh, uh, programs uh, for pest control, record keeping, security, and of course having standard operating uh, procedures for all uh, these. But last but not the least, it is very important to know how to dispose of the hazards or the bio uh, material that you are uh, working with. Uh, understand the rules for the uh, safe disposal. So uh, separate out the waste. Non-contaminated general waste is uh, separated. Sharps, needles, glass are put into white translucent bags. Contaminated uh, material has to be autoclaved. And you have got, we have got, uh, these are WHO color coded uh, bags, uh, which you use for autoclaving biohazard waste must be uh, collected in red plastic bags. Uh, material which has to be incinerated, such as if you have worked with an animal and the animal carcass has to be disposed, you use the yellow colored uh, bags and all the biohazard waste of human and animal origin must be uh, incinerated. So these are a few insights and the equipment which are required at different uh, biosafety levels. So if there are questions, I can answer. Yeah. Shall we move to the next yeah. yeah. uh, uh, Thank you, Dr. Dr. Uh, to present on the emergency procedures and report. Emergency procedures and reporting requirements. Please, doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Shalini. I'll take one minute to come. not coming. find uh, my slides.
Uh, now it's okay. okay. Now, okay. now it's okay now? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I'll make it slide presentation. Just one second. It's coming? Yes. It's okay now? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, as we discussed yesterday, and Dr. Uh, Viba also informed about uh, the uh, uh, necessity to observe uh, all the biosafety measures when we are uh, experimenting with a mosquito like Aedes aegypti, because uh, it carries a very big risk uh, uh, when we do uh, uh, research with a mosquito like Aedes aegypti. So it's very important uh, that we uh, need to understand uh, uh, the principles behind uh, uh, the GM mosquitoes in our uh, laboratories. And uh, before I go forward, let me just have a word of uh, uh, security in the sense that uh, there are many other countries and people and scientists who have already worked to a uh, uh, rather uh, a more advanced stage of uh, GM mosquito research. And uh, let us just see uh, the background of the uh, GM research uh, across the world. The contained experiment with GMM have been made in many countries, including Malaysia, Polynesian Islands, Brazil, Panama, and very recently also the US. A few countries uh, have also made open releases of GM mosquitoes, and uh, these include uh, the Brazil, uh, Kame Island in the uh, archipelago of West Indies, and uh, the US very recently. There are many, uh, uh, there, there are mainly two techniques invoked one to replace the population of the vector, another is to suppress the uh, vector population. Is still the third uh, technology is also uh, being uh, uh, developed, which is to disable uh, the vector by producing wingless mosquitoes in order to curtail their flights. <coughs> the use of our ideal technology, uh, that is the uh, uh, um, uh, technology which is developed by the Oxitech, is not intended to completely annihilate the mosquito from the planet, but is only to reduce its population to a very low level <coughs> so that dengue transmission is interrupted. Along with the dengue, there are three other <coughs> major diseases across the world which would be also taken care of. These include chikungunya, Zika, and in Central and Southern America, <clears throat> as well as Africa, the yellow fever. Aedes aegypti may not have been originated in South Asia, but the population of the mosquito had been existing in this region for ages. So there is no difficulty of the mosquito to be brought under the uh, umbrella of various experimentations. <clears throat> Here I show a picture in order to substantiate my uh, information that many uh, countries had been working on uh, uh, GM mosquitoes and as you can see many countries have uh, uh, already uh, pronounced that a great degree of suppression of the vector mosquito had been achieved uh, in their experiment. You can see virtually everywhere it's more than 92 percent a reduction, which is a great uh, um, uh, success, uh, considering uh, if the mosquito is reduced even by 60-70% in the natural population, there is always a very serious impact on the transmission of the disease.
Aedes aegypti occupies a very important role uh, in among all the mosquitoes of the world. First, because it's a very sturdier mosquito. Uh, second, because it has certain properties by which it can get distributed uh, even when there is no water around. That means that its eggs have that kind of uh, characteristics whereby the mosquito is able to uh, overcome the uh, dry season or dry environments. It can uh, withstand the uh, desiccation or, or, or the adverse environment uh, around which the eggs are laid. And eggs can survive not only for days and weeks and months, sometimes for a couple of years the eggs can survive uh, without the water around. So this mosquito is the vector for dengue all over the world, the major vector of dengue. <clears throat> the classification is given here, which is important to understand its hierarchy in the animal kingdom. The mosquito has a very uh, agile larva. Uh, the larva uh, can be identified in any kind of uh, situation by its uh, serpentine or wriggling movement of the body. No other mosquitoes, either of the malaria mosquitoes or of lymphatic fluorosis or JE mosquitoes, do that kind of wriggling or serpentine movement. The movement of Aedes mosquitoes, particularly Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, are very, is very, very specific. So it can be easily identified. And, and, and because uh, most of the lab studies are done on the uh, larva, so it is very important for us to understand the larva morphology and its behavior. How do we uh, identify a larva of the vector, which is a non-GM mosquito or a non-transgenic mosquito, and the larva, which is descended from the uh, transgenic mosquito. As we all know that a fluorescent uh, is used uh, along with the uh, technique of uh, GM. The fluorescent is uh, <clears throat> imbibed into certain part of the body of the larva and in the UV light it it flourishes, it glows, and one can easily identify which larva is which, whether it is a non-transgenic larva, mo mosquito larva, or it's a transgenic mosquito larva. So here in the picture, the top picture, if you see, the middle one is not glowing. So it is the wild mosquito larva, and it is flanked by the larva, both of which are transgenic mosquito larva because you can see that the green uh, fluorescent is glowing, particularly across the uh, dorsum line of the, uh, the lower mosquito, which is a very characteristic feature of the fluorescent as we see in Drosophila melanogaster also. In the bottom uh, picture, uh, you can again, identify from the head of the mosquito uh, 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 which is which emerges that the mosquito having fluorescent is clearly visible on the right side uh, in comparison to the one which is not having any glow on the left side so by having uh, the fluorescent uh, dyed uh, larvae, we can identify them very easily from those of non-GM mosquito larva. Once the transgenic mosquitoes have been created, uh, uh, there is a there is there in in case of the Indian liver trees, the larvae. Are
collect it or transport it to the laboratory. Uh, and they show promise in laboratory and semi-field contained trial open field release will the but this is open field release will come only after the initial phases of one and two had been done absolutely correctly and satisfactorily the release is designed to better understand the effectiveness of geo mosquitoes and any side effects that could become apparent under more realistic conditions so there is a whole long procedure to go for the phase one, phase two, and phase three, the field trial of the mosquitoes. And uh, unless the first uh, 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 few, uh, first and second trials have uh, uh, done the justice, the, uh, the field trial phase uh, will not be achieved. Care must therefore be taken in designing and implementation of the field trial based on the results achieved in the uh, phase one, two, and three. These considerations are especially pertinent because the mosquito is a vector of human disease. If there is a leakage, if there is a uh, mistake in uh, 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 seeing all the mosquitoes uh, remain in our cage, either in the laboratory or in the containment, uh, it would be a serious uh, uh, drawback for the experiment and uh, that uh, th therefore uh, it would be very, very uh, dangerous. Uh, uh, so leakage should be avoided at every cost. The transgenes are designed to spread through the mosquito population at faster than Mendelian rates of inherit. The, the basic principle of Mendel by which uh, the calculation had been made, uh, this particular uh, design of the experimentation uh, see that the uh, uh, multiplication of the uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, the 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 population in the field of the uh, GM mosquitoes uh, go uh, rather faster, unhindered uh, when compared to the Mendelian rates of uh, inheritance. The RIDL or SIT technology works in a rather simple manner. There is a process of huge mass rearing of the mosquito of which the males only are selected uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, creating transgenic mosquito. So these are the males in this technology which are released or which are tested in the experiment uh, throughout phase one, phase two. And when the, the principle behind having the male only transgenic is that when they are uh, release in the field and they and mate with the wild females, the uh, first generation, the F1, uh, is having the gene which uh, uh, impacts further uh, the development of the uh, larval population, the larval uh, development from 1 to 2, 2 to 3 is blocked. So there is no further development or further progression in the population of uh, uh, larval stages and therefore the mosquito population dies. This gradual dying of the population uh, as a result of the uh, uh, descendant from the uh, transgenic mosquito will gradually affect the population in the nature. So the most important thing would be first to do the phased laboratory and uh, semi-laboratory or semi-field condition or, or, or uh, physical contained uh, uh, experimentation in order to get the data whether or not the uh, uh, transgenic mosquito under all situation is good to go further for uh, the field uh, release of the final experiment. These include the laboratory studies, analytic or computer simulation of the studies, the contained field trials, and final 
if everything goes on good and is on record, everything uh, unchallenged, it goes for the final uh, open release trials. Now the laboratory study which makes the phase one is very, very important because the whole design of laboratory study has to be done in advance and uh, a laboratory has to be self-sustained. Uh, that means there has to be uh, no unwanted entry into the laboratory, nor the material from the laboratory, or in other words, from the insectary uh, to go out of the laboratory. So it has to be a an amply spaced laboratory, uh, something by something like twenty one into 19 uh, 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 feet uh, area in which there have to be a very specific chambers uh, chamber of uh, 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 maintaining the uh, uh, colony of the riddle mosquitoes and uh, uh, co uh, the chamber for rearing uh, the uh, riddle uh, uh, population and the chamber where the biological experiments will be conducted. The entrance also has to be double doored and in such a way that uh, in no case the mosquito from any place, even if it had run out of the uh, barod cage uh, in the room, it would not find a way out of that room because the whole room is screened uh, even the uh, air conditioner uh, fitting uh, area also is screened in such a way that no mosquito, even if it comes out of its cage, uh, is able to go out. So the whole laboratory is well designed. And uh, as Dr. Viva was telling that uh, IBSC always plays a major role in, uh, in designing or in approving uh, the uh, uh, design of the laboratory uh, so that the experiments uh, go on without any fault or error. These are the inside stories of uh, various rooms of uh, uh, the uh, 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 laboratory, where the uh, even the basic things like uh, area for washing hands, area for uh, keeping the trays, area for keeping the waste, area for doing the biological experiment, area for uh, uh, keeping the adults in the borrowed cage, and area for making your uh, office work or lab work uh, on the register or in diaries. Everything has to be more or less uh, impermeable uh, from any other place in the within the laboratory. The doors have to be double doored uh, for making the entry restricted and as Dr. Gaurav was telling there has to be a proper recording of the people coming in or going out for after the work is over and their and their timings and uh, kind of the work etc everything is noted in the register. There has to there will be a place where uh, at the entry site where detailed rules to be followed within the liberty are placed on everybody is supposed to follow the rules for example people coming with the outer shoes will not uh, uh, run uh, 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 berserk uh, within the uh, liberty range uh, they have to see uh, their shoes are put off uh, outside the uh, uh, laboratory and they wear uh, the closed shoes, the, uh, the, the, the uh, linen shoes or other kind of a uh, smaller uh, 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 slippers uh, which are maintained for the laboratory work uh, and then only they enter. So there are rules already placed on the rules board and everybody is supposed to know about them before entering into the uh, uh, this uh, uh, laboratory, uh, the uh, the arthropod containment laboratory. Uh, minimum level is two. 
there has to be one uh, anti mosquito bat or racket uh, for meeting out any uh, warrant situation uh, where uh, the mosquito is found uh, flying uh, freely around and this without knowing whether it is wild or uh, the transgenic has to be immediately uh, tapped and uh, uh, trapped and uh, uh, destroyed. So a uh, no mosquito of any kind, because we do not know about the mosquito, whether this mosquito is belonging to the transgenic or the non-transgenic, will must be uh, going out of the laboratory. Therefore, counting of the larvae, counting of the eggs, counting of the pupae and adults must coincide. And, and this is the job of the laboratory maintenance uh, person. So, uh, there are, uh, there have been two uh, uh, institutions in the country which started some experiment with the RIDL. One was IBAT uh, near Chennai and another is GBIT uh, in Maharashtra. And uh, the uh, GBIT is, is still on the uh, uh, job of uh, uh, doing the experiment with the RIDL. And uh, they, they have made many studies and uh, and uh, i would be uh, uh, referring to uh, the detailed plan of the studies that they have undertaken uh, when they are working on the laboratory uh, experiments with the uh, transgenic mosquito so this is the rearing of the normal aedes aegypti the cycle is very simple both the transgenic and the non transgenic should have invariably unchanged in their cycle. The number of the days they take from trans for transformation from one stage to another, that is from egg to larva to pupa to, to adult, must be comparable. And this is why the uh, normal or the wild type and the uh, riddle uh, 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 taxon or riddle uh, technology mosquito, the transgenic mosquito, are reared under the same condition of the laboratory of temperature and humidity maintained uh, and to see whether they work uh, absolutely in the same manner or not. Only if they are working in the same manner in both their physiology and uh, other activities, then only the GM mosquito is considered viable for further experimentation. One can easily distinguish the two larvae in the pan or in the vial where both transgenic and non-transgenic larvae are being reared. Once uh, seen under the uh, 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 under the fluorescent uh, microscope, one can easily see the uh, fluorescent dyed uh, larvae and can easily distinguish them from the wild ones. So, looking at the various distinctive features of the laboratory experiment, the phase one, the containment, uh, uh, field containment uh, studies, uh, the phase two, and uh, after that, the field release experiment, uh, uh, the phase three. I have discussed with you the structure uh, requirement of the laboratory uh, studies uh, uh, containment or laboratory or the uh, uh, ACL2 laboratory, and uh, we will we will also see uh, what is the structural requirement of the containment structure for meeting out phase two. So in the in the phase one, what do we acquire is the proof of concept, the live table studies in order to find out whether the mosquito is doing the same general principles of development, the mating competitiveness, that both the transgenic and the non-transgenic mosquitoes mate well parallelly and without any major difference 
uh, of data and number four both the types of the mosquito must behave more or less similarly against the conventional insecticides involved. In phase two, our requirement would be mostly with respect to the mating competitiveness. This factor is very important because this uh, actually determines the uh, number of the uh, progenies or F1 generation uh, produced by the uh, transgenic male mating with the wild type of the female mosquitoes. And then finally, after the F1 generation is done, what is the level of the population separation? All these are statistically uh, uh, evaluated, uh, assessed, and then uh, after determining that phase one and phase two have gone well without any contradictions to our understanding of the biology of the mosquito, we enter into the next and the most important phase of the open field uh, release experiments. But that comes in the end. That comes only when the first two have been done absolutely perfectly and uh, there is a also uh, acceptance by the uh, stakeholder uh, of every kind uh, in the nature. So, these are the various steps of the laboratory studies. Uh, in the laboratory, as I said in the previous uh, slide, we had uh, four major components of the study. The development of the genetically injured mosquito lines or the population. It will progress to phenotypic evaluation of GE mosquito lines. Then the next step will be Introgression of transgenes into the genetic background of target population. And finally, to the phenotypic evaluation of transgenic endemic strain, including testing for adverse effect on target or non target uh, species. The non target species experiments are equally important because we need to evaluate whether the transgene present into the transgenic mosquitoes will have any kind of adverse effect on the non-target organism. Non-target organism which come in association with the transgenic mosquitoes or which feed upon the transgenic mosquitoes in any way, whether they are affected or not. In the C column, we see that field site selection and character, characterization comprise scientific considerations, regulatory considerations, community engagement and considerations. As I said, these are exceptionally important and without that, the final stage of experiment cannot be continued. Development of the field site it has to be decided whether the field site for the field release experiment has to be insular one, that is the island kind of things, landlocked, or it has to be a contiguous land. Everything has to be decided in advance with the full knowledge that a full control on the released mosquito will be kept under charge. So then uh, we will uh, have, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go to this thing. We will uh, uh, do the uh, laboratory experiments of different kinds and uh, how the laboratory experiments are practically done. This is one example. Initially. Sir, can you, can you please summarize that? Because I think we are running over time. Can I get five minutes only? Sure, sir. Sure, please. I, I'll I'll go fast, but I'll I'll finish it. So initially, 
we get uh, from the uh, laboratory population developed from the transgenic and the non-transgenic mosquitoes are uh, 30 pupae and uh, they are kept into a required amount of the water and then uh, uh, we do the pairing etc uh, we provide the blood meal in the borrowed cages to the emerged adults the the uh, uh, eggs are collected into the ov traps and uh, uh, the males and females uh, 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 are uh, the embryonated eggs uh, uh, are are aired right because there would be some eggs which will not be to hatch the eggs and then uh, we need to take 150 first star larvae from each parents uh, in the uh, 50 in the 50 or 100 ml uh, enamel tray so this is the way the uh, development will take place l1 is born l1 to l2 to l3 and then finally l4 is formed and from the l4 pupa would be formed The adults which are uh, formed, uh, 20 adults uh, uh, will be taken for experiment. We need to see their development, uh, their survivorship, uh, because uh, they are fed on the glucose. Later on, they are fed on the blood meal. And uh, 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 then uh, they are kept for 24 hours. And uh, their fecundity and hatchability uh, is uh, then uh, counted uh, regularly for nearly 24 hours. So uh, the result is something like this. Uh, we we see that the, both the transgenic and the non-transgenic mosquitoes lay more or less similar number of the eggs, mostly around 100. So it, it has to be comparable. The number of the hatched larvae also should not differ statistically. Similarly, for uh, the embryonated egg, should also be more or less the same in both the populations. And then the the time taken from L1 to L4, the pupa and the emergence of the adults should not differ between the two. I'll go to the major uh, 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 figure in order. This is the table to show the uh, uh, two generations, two, two different populations of transgenic and non-transgenic uh, having been tested for their susceptibility against the conventional insecticide. So it has to be also confirmed that the transgenic mosquito does not behave uh, differently from that of the uh, uh, wild one when they are su subjected to the treatment of uh, the insecticides uh, used in public health control. We make a very sincere uh, experiment to gain data on their life tables how they develop in terms of time and space and the data that come out of it should prove that both the uh, strains or lines behave normally similarly we do a very important experiment with the mating competitiveness between the two lines as I said, after the laboratory experiment is over, we go to the uh, 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 physically uh, physical contained uh, area outside the laboratory. And uh, this has to be also uh, formulated or this has to be designed very carefully, keeping in mind the various requirement of the experiments. I'll show you uh, uh, somewhere uh, the design. At the end of the laboratory investigations, we 
develop a clear understanding of uh, the various experiments, data derived from the various experiment, right from the hatching uh, or the egg laying to the uh, live table formations. And we understand that the uh, the the transgenic mosquito is absolutely good in its behavior compared to the wild kind of the mosquito. I'll show you that figure where so so uh, after the whole. Yeah, ma'am. The thing is, today our focus is mainly on uh, containment facility, uh, which yes. you have already explained. I yes. think this community and public engagement, we can have it later. Yeah, I'm not talking. I'm not talking of that. So I'm not touching. Today, today, the focus is basically on the work in contained facilities, yeah, uh, yeah, which yeah. you have already explained. Yes, I think yes. Maybe can just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm closing. I'm closing here. I'm closing here. So, so uh, uh, after uh, the laboratory experiment, we go to a kind of a phase two experiment in the field. And uh, after determining the mosquitoes are behaving absolutely uh, same under the uh, more uh, freely ecological conditions made available to them, then only the uh, GM mosquito uh, is considered good for the phase three studies. That's all. I will close over here. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, participants, if you all have any questions, uh, now the time is, uh, the floor is open for the question. I see one the question from Chandrika. Okay, Chandrika, if you can. Yeah, Chandrika, you have made a comment. Whom are you asking? Dr. Chandrika, she has raised okay. her question. Oh. Chandrika has left the meeting, I see. Maybe she's, it's the disconnection or. Uh... Yeah, she left the. Uh, she has posted the question in the chat, chat group. Yeah. yeah. I thought if she was there, we could ask her to interact, you know. But she was going off and on in between. Probably. Anyway. Uh, so the question which Dr. Chandrika has raised is uh, regarding the laboratories uh, that are inspected uh, for their suitability for the purpose and are there any international uh, documents which can be accepted as the guide. Uh, so actually Dr. Lalita Gauda is madam is the is the um, you know uh, is authorized uh, this thing for uh, uh, accreditation board as well as the GLP compliance committee in India. So uh, she is going to tomorrow talk about what all the international standards are there which can be followed. But in this particular case, I just want to say that in case of GMOs, actually it won't be like this. It would be like, you know, uh, case by case analysis and then um, uh, the, the requirements will have to be stipulated or uh, endorsed by the national regulatory authorities. So up to BSL 1 and 2, normally people follow the international guidelines. But when it actually comes to the 3 and 4, it has to be very strictly uh, monitored by the monitored by the national regulatory authorities. And they only uh, prescribe the inspection uh, requirements. But definitely I have request, already requested Madam, she is going to include this in her presentation as also uh, answer it tomorrow. So, Madam, if you have any additional comments, then you can kindly share.
No, I think tomorrow I can just add that uh, thing. Okay, thank you. Then uh, we can actually uh, convey that message to Dr. Chandrika. Any other participants? You all have any other comments or questions? Yeah, hello, Dr. Vipa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is regarding the uh, uh, disposal of the biohazardous waste. Uh, yeah. yeah, as Dr. Lalita mentioned, there were um, information regarding the collection for the institute. After collection, who is responsible? Because when the institute collects the biohazardous components, is there further information? information is mentioned there for the disposal or who is the responsible person to dispose that actually uh, i will answer that viva actually the person who is responsible for disposing is uh, the, the laboratory who is doing this let me give you in our country mm -hmm. we have got uh, commercial agents who come and collect the waste they have got license for incineration because incineration must be done away from the city. There is some rules for that. So yeah. what we do is these color coded bags, you know, the red and yellow, we keep them and we put it down in our notebook. How much of waste uh, is there in those bags? And then we have these waste disposal collectors who come to the institutes and collect that waste and they take it for incineration because all this biohazard waste has to be incinerated. So I'm sure in Sri Lanka also, if you if you have something called a pollution control board or something, they will have the uh, system. You might have to uh, find out what the system is for the disposal. In uh, most of the countries, and even in the US, I uh, think they, we have a system where they come and collect the waste and go. The biological or biohazardous waste. Yeah, I also experienced these things in Europe. I know the agencies, they come and collect. Uh, but the situation about Sri Lanka, I'm not aware. Is there anybody who have idea about is such agencies are available in Sri Lanka or we have to implement that one? You so might not. Just Talk to your pollution control board and find yes. out. Yeah. Yeah, I was coming to that only uh, because you know, uh, in case there is no specific, uh, like you know, in our country also there is no specific guideline for GM as such. Yeah. But like what Madam said, these are the people who follow what we call guidelines for common biomedical waste treatment and bio and disposal facilities. And these guidelines are issued by pollution control board. So I am sure in Sri Lanka also there would be guidelines for biomedical waste. So one can find out and just follow that, you know, sort of adopt that in your uh, process. Um, if, I, if I can just jump in there, this is Darshan from KDU. There is a company called, I think, Stericycle. So there is one company which actually will uh, collect and they, and they are registered and all of that is there. But otherwise, uh, as regarding the solution uh, control board, I don't know, I think it's handled by the Ministry of Environment. They have a unit which comes and monitors the um, sterilization, basically the units. You have the um, biohazard is generally hospitals having. So at KDU we have one and uh, yeah, incinerator there. And then, and again, like you said, it is very correct. It can't be inside the city. It has to be outside. So we are outside the city. So therefore, we have an incinerator at the hospital here. So we'll have to, I think, the main biosafety uh, office or the coordinating center, I think we'll have to have this information and be current as to which companies are doing this. And because sometimes 
uh, to my knowledge sometimes a company has lost the license or at least been told to stop for some time because of some violation and then until then you go through a crisis where you don't have a place to put the garbage so yeah, things like that too so, so i think we need to tighten those and maybe advise and uh, uh, follow up on those things. okay thank you Okay. So any any more questions or Any questions from the participants? So, in the absence of question, shall we conclude or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. If there are any questions, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow right. is the third day. Okay. Yeah. And then tomorrow we will keep more time for interaction. And uh, you know, request all the participants also uh, to, uh, if they have any doubts or if they have any, you know, like for example, calculating uh, you know, the, the risk levels or the containment requirements. Because tomorrow we are going to have the other issues, you know. The crux of the thing was identifying the bio safety level and what would be my operational procedures so that is sort of covered but then there are lots of allied issues which we are going to take up tomorrow and also share a lot of other resources uh, for use so maybe at that time we can have a kind of a recap of the two days and there are any questions we can take up tomorrow thank you thank you very much National Consultant, National Consultant and the participants on behalf of National Science Foundation. Thank you very much. And all the participants, hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have sent an email to all the participants but yesterday. We have created a group also. I'm going to go to the hospital. I'm going to go to the hospital.